Would the following men be considered to be Christians on the day of their baptism? Alexander Campbell, Fausto Salvoni, Barton W. Stone, and etc. I haven't heard of that last one. But, uh, <laughs> and then it goes on to say, uh, since they had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of the Church of Christ as we know it today. And then he goes on to say, or they go on to say, if these uh, uh, were New Testament Christians by their baptism, uh, why does it rank heresy for a man to say that an individual uh, today, under the same circumstances, would not be a New Testament Christian? And why would it be heresy to suggest that they would not be? And then this question, are there Christians in the Church of Christ instrumental, such as Don DeWelt and company out of Missouri, uh, can a sincere person be baptized for remission of sins by someone performing it for another reason? That is, a Baptist preacher or a denominational preacher. Uh, a brother in Ohio desires information about whether those in the Christian church have obeyed the gospel. What of their state? Tie in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 with this, which says, For by one spirit we all baptized into one body. And then I was handed this question just today that goes along with it. Is it possible for one to be taught wrong on any subject other than baptism, then to be baptized right, that is, for the remission of one's sins. If not, have you or anybody else in this uh, auditorium ever been taught wrong on anything? Well, I was once. Someone taught me that I had been wrong, and it bothered me for a long time until I learned about it. But uh, now let's discuss this. Let me just set this scenario, and I believe it will help us to get started. Let's suppose that uh, someone has given me a Bible, and I've never been to Bible study, and I've never been to worship, and I've never been to a gospel meeting, but I can read, and I can reason. And I'm a farmer, and I plowed out in the field about seven hours that day, and I sit down in the afternoon to, in the shade to get me a cold drink of water to relax and refresh my mind, and I brought my Bible with me. And I began reading the Bible, and I've been reading for several days, every day, about an hour at a time, and I'm in the book of Acts, and I've read what men did in order to become a Christian. And that's what I want to be as a Christian. And I want to do just what I've read in that book. And after all, the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. It's not apostolic succession. It's not preachers. It's not the church of Christ church, as some people would speak. Uh, the truth is in the book and will be judged by the words of Christ, John 12, 48. And I want to do what I've read. And I want to be what those people were. And they were just Christians. And all of a sudden, I see a man running down the road. I don't notice he has on a prison uniform. I don't know he's an escaped prisoner, but he's running. And he's coming by me, and I grab him. I say, friend, I want you to help me. And he seems anxious to get away. But I say, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to help me obey the Lord. And I explain to him what Acts 8 and Acts 2 and Acts 22 and Acts 16 teach. And I finally prevail upon him to take me down to the pond there, down to the river, and baptize me into Christ, Galatians 3.27. Uh, that I might be buried with Christ in baptism, risen with him through faith in the operation of God who raised him from the dead, Colossians 2.12, to be baptized for remission of sins, to wash away my sins, Acts 22.16. And he does that. And soon he's on his way. Question, am I a Christian? Why, well, certainly I'm a Christian. Now, same scene. I'm well known in a community and I know all the denominational preachers and what's more, I know what they teach. But I've never obeyed anything, and I'm sitting there that afternoon reading my Bible. And I see the simple plan of salvation, and I won't obey it. Would it be logical for me to find a denominational preacher that taught the opposite of that and ask him to assist me? Now, he could. For what he does isn't important. It's what I, what I understand that's important. I would logically find someone that was more in concert with what I was wanting to do. So each one of these uh, cases uh, we have to take individually. I asked Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone and so forth, I'd like to say three or four things. I never did know that either one of them was the head of the church. I didn't know we had to use them as examples on obedience or disobedience. They were just human beings who incidentally taught some error. I believe we do have some Camelites among us. Now, what they did or didn't do has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches I must do. I'm not denying they obeyed the Lord. I'm not affirming they did. We're just talking about uh, a principle here. But to suggest that they knew nothing about the church of Christ, as we know now, is one of the most sectarian 
views I've ever heard of. You mean they've never read their New Testament? Now, if someone is willing to deny that the church of Christ, as we know it, is not related to the New Testament church you read about in the Bible, then that'd be another matter. I guess it's the way even some of us view the expression church of Christ. If I did not believe the church that I'm a member of was the church you read about in the Bible, I'd find one that was and be a part of it. No, we're not perfect. And we must continually search the truth and not restore the restoration movement, but restore New Testament Christianity. I'm not trying to restore what Campbell and Stone did. If you've been to Cane Ridge lately, you surely wouldn't want to restore at least what their devotees are now today. We're trying to go back beyond Rome and Constantinople and Bethany and Cane Ridge and Midway and get all the way back to the day of Pentecost, the day it all began. And to suggest that those men knew nothing of the church you read about in the Bible really indicts their sincerity. I believe they were striving to be New Testament Christians. And that's what we're striving to be. But I have met some brethren who are sectarian to the core. They talk about Church of Christ preachers. Don't ever call me that. I'm a gospel preacher. I know I'm not a Church of Christ preacher because I aggravate too many of my brethren to be one of those. <laughs> the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, is the teaching of Luke 8, 11. And in man's quest for truth, whether his name is Campbell, Salvoni, Stone, or anybody else, when he obeys the simple message of the New Testament, obeys from the heart that form of teaching delivered him, he then becomes a servant of righteousness, Romans 6, 16 through 18. And who did the immersing is not the important thing. Again, though, if I'm a man in a community where there are those who teach the truth that I want to obey, I would naturally ask them to assist me. But if I know nothing at all of that, and I want to be a New Testament Christian, I can get that man escaping from prison. I can get another farmer. I can get a neighbor. I could use a man who taught error. Because what I understand is what is important and not what he teaches and what he thinks. Now let's be very practical. I have very many people listening to denominational preachers who say, Baptism is not essential for remission of sins. Have very many people listening to that ever obeyed the truth? Logic would deny they had. Didn't say no one ever had. My dad was raised in the leading southern denomination. And he had heard for 21 and a half years what they taught. And when he was challenged to study his Bible, he studied with Brother G.C. Brewer for six straight months in our hometown of Sherman, Texas. And they had a running debate every Sunday morning on the book of Acts. And after six months, the man who later became my dad said, I couldn't argue the truth anymore. He knew what he had been taught. And he listened to the truth being taught and even debated a false cause for six months. And then he obeyed the truth. But he didn't go back to that denominational preacher who taught you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved and said, baptize me. He asked G.C. Brewer, who taught the truth, that they had studied out of the Bible to assist him in obeying that truth. Sometimes when we hear sermons on Christians in denominations and all, we jump the gun and we aren't even logical. And it is possible to be sectarian and think that unless we taught it and we did it and we did the immersing, no one could possibly be a Christian. You ought to have been with me in Adelaide, Australia many years ago. We advertised in the newspaper in that city of 800,000 people. Now it's over a million. But then it had 800,000 people. We advertised a gospel meeting downtown in a rented hall where all the buses and trains and other conveyances meshed and so people from all over that metropolitan area could come and we said are you interested in pure New Testament Christianity come and study the gospel with us well we had large crowds one night as we began I saw standing in the back a man I knew he was from Europe because of the way he wore his hat and just the way he looked and as uh, soon as the meeting was over he came to me and introduced himself he said, I'm Brother Gdansky. That's the way he said, from Poland. He said, I know you're my brother because you teach what we teach. And he said, I'm, uh, later he let me know he was not a part of the movement in Poland that some of our brethren 
thought they had discovered. He went way back beyond that, back long before when they met in barns and so forth for primitive New Testament Christianity, pristine Christianity. And the more I visited with him and talked with him and heard him teach, I could tell he was a New Testament Christian if I've ever met one. In fact, I began to wonder about myself. You know why? You know how they were different than we were? They just lived a more godly life. They weren't materialistic. They were spiritual to the core. How'd they become Christians? Obeyed the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God. I didn't write back and say, well, we really found a great opportunity here. I might baptize 50 of those people. Well, they were Christians before they ever heard of us. They were Christians because they obeyed the truth. And so the premium's on truth. Let's don't be sectarian. On the other hand, I wish some of my brethren wouldn't be so impractical in their presentation. Some of them act like that any denominational person on earth and preacher on earth just baptizing folk into Christ right and left. Kind of hard for me to believe that a fellow who says sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, anyone take your pick or none of them, you say before, you don't have to be baptized and even ridicule baptism, would assist someone in obeying the gospel of the Son of God. Now we'll pause for some discussion. That's enough on that for me right now. Anyone like to make a comment? Take the microphones to them, please. Johnny, my name is Theophilus Agnoski. Uh, I recently had the pleasure of learning from a man who was a missionary over in the uh, <coughs> Orient. I believe it was Thailand. He came upon a group of, I believe it was Presbyterians, who practiced scriptural baptism for the remission of sins that a person was not saved until afterward. I have a, well, I would not hesitate to call these my brothers and sisters in Christ, although they took upon a denominational name. For what reason they were still holding that, I don't know. I don't know if they had an instrument in worship. But would you respond to that? In the first place, uh, well, let me just give you a parallel, and I think that'll help, and then we'll get started on that. I happen to be privileged to read the first letter that Preshan Karluki wrote to the United States from India back in 1950, I believe it was. Uh, he was a leader of a Presbyterian group uh, and left it with some 1,500 others and uh, became New Testament Christians. And they taught the truth on the plan of salvation and so forth. For some reason, a letterhead from the College Church of Christ in Abilene, where Glenn Wallace was preaching at that time, had come across uh, his uh, view in India, and he wrote, to whom it may concern, and had the address, College Church of Christ, so forth, Abilene, Texas. And uh, Brother Glenn Wallace uh, privileged me, honored me, in letting me read that when I was a student there, and I read subsequent letters. Here's an interesting thing. The men set forth what they did in worship and what they believed and what they taught. And in the entire correspondence, the only thing that Brother Wallace could find in the correspondence anyway was that they didn't observe the Lord's Supper each first day of the week. They did it probably once a month or something like that. And he wrote uh, Pressure on Carluke back and mentioned Acts 20, verse 7, the very next letter. He said, thank you, brother. I said, that's what we'll do from now on. I said, we just overlooked that passage. So the attitude that those people had. Now, what we ought to do with folk like that is instruct them that the Presbyterian expression is sectarianism and inquire as to their worship and their position on various things and teach the way of the Lord more perfectly. Acts chapters 18 and 19. And you don't have a problem with identifying them as a brother. If they taught the truth on how they became a Christian... Uh, you would say in whatever areas they were erring, brethren, they were, and we'd help them out of that. But as far as if they've obeyed the gospel of the Son of God, they're New Testament Christians. I said, if they have. Sometimes people say, well, how about the Mormons then? Uh, now, listen carefully. That, that has, that's no problem at all uh, in answering that. Last October, it was my privilege on a Friday, a Thursday and Friday of an October weekend to be in Independence, Missouri, the headquarters of the reorganized Mormon church. And I went down and talked with their leaders for an hour and a half. I caught the plane uh, and went to Salt Lake City for a gospel meeting starting the next Sunday. 
So in one week, I was at the headquarters of the Mormons in both groups. Reorganized, they have about 230,000 members. And the Salt Lake City group, uh, which has uh, about uh, two and a half, three million, according to the, what they say. And I went down to their headquarters, talked to their leaders for about an hour. The ones in uh, Salt Lake City said, those fellows in Independence said, they'll have to be baptized again or we won't recognize them. They'll never be real move, uh, part of this movement until they're baptized by the proper authority. And they're talking about Joseph Smith. So you're talking about a completely different thing there. If these people were baptized under the authority of Christ for the remission of sins and did everything we can teach them to do, then at that moment they were New Testament Christians. Thereafter, wherein they erred, they must be instructed properly. But with the Mormon situation, their authority system is absolutely, totally unscriptural. It calls for a latter-day revelation, a latter-day prophet, and a false priesthood, and so forth. But in the, the setting of the questions that have been asked, uh, we need to be less sectarian, more scriptural, more spiritual in our approach, and yet practical and in recent days, we've had some sermons and some talks that have left me with a distinct impression that brethren are trying to enlarge the kingdom from what New Testament Christianity would allow. We ought to honor the boundaries that God has set. We don't want to be stricter than the Scriptures or looser than the Scriptures. We just want to be scriptural. And uh, it bothers me. I'll be real honest with you. It's bothered me for a number of years, and I've written some articles about it. It bothers me that I, we do have a syndrome among us to want to be Camelites. Well, do you want to be like Campbell when he wrote the Lunenburg letter and said open membership was all right? Is that the way you want to be like Campbell? You want to be like Campbell and be in favor of the Missionary Society? You want to be like Campbell and believe in premillennialism? I'll tell you the greatest thing he ever did was say, let's go back to the Bible. Well, let's go back to the Bible. There's where the authority is. We ought to be grateful when we find anybody on earth that believes the truth on the plan of salvation. In answer, let's, if I haven't answered yet, if they obeyed the gospel of the Son of God, if they did everything we teach them to do, yes, they'd be our brethren. But they're going to have to be instructed on errors and so forth that align them with denominationalism. Just like some of our brethren today in the church of Christ must be instructed on worldliness and slothfulness and other things. Yes, Johnny, sir. I've never heard anybody comment on women baptizing. Women baptizing women, say the man wasn't around, baptizing the man. Would you make some remarks along that line? Well, again, those who know the scriptures would know that uh, if there are men available, a woman would be out of place, and that is in any other thing, taking the lead in spiritual matters. But uh, I knew of a place in Darwin, Australia, in the Northern Territory, which is one of the most remote towns in the world. In fact, Japan bombed it in World War II, and Australia was such a vast expanse, it didn't even come inland, and they couldn't have bombed a more insignificant place in the history of the world. And if they'd taken Australia, they wouldn't have known what to do with it. But uh, uh, incidentally, way up there in that isolated area in Darwin, Northern Territory, Australia, there were two or three women who were members of the Church of the Lord. And when they taught other women, they did baptize them. Amen. Amen. And for many, many, many months, there were no men at all, except occasionally a preacher would fly up there on a weekend and do some personal work in the community and preach and work with them on the first day of the week. And then, of course, he tended to all of that. But uh, again, we, we just take what the scriptures say. A woman couldn't be out of place in baptizing another woman if there weren't any men around. Not you serving authority over anybody, teaching over anybody. This, this before you close, this man, you know, that uh, flagged the man down that was out of prison. What about his wife? Could his wife have baptized him? But she, he didn't have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's like uh, this, you've heard the old question, what about the man on the way to the water tank, and a tree falls on him, the way to the water tank uh, to be baptized and the tree falls on him? Brother S.C. Kenningham uh, came from Missouri, and he had an old uncle that preached in the Boot Hill country of Missouri years ago, back in the horse and buggy days. And when anyone asked Brother Kenningham, what about the man on the way to the water tank and the tree falls on him? He said, the tree won't hit him. The horse will jump out of the way. And he said, now I can document that. He said, I've never heard of a tree fall on anybody, uh, but I've heard of a tree that fell towards somebody. He said, my old uncle was a preacher up in Missouri. And they were in this, in this wagon heading toward the water hole to baptize a man. 
And as they went around the bend, an old dead tree started falling right toward the man in the back who was on his way to be baptized. And just before it hit him, the horse jumped out of the way and missed him. So he answered it. Uh, the tree won't hit him. A horse will jump out of the way. But that man didn't have a wife. Uh, next question or comment. In other words, I don't. Don't bother me. I don't know the answer. <clears throat> I was in a town recently, the church I just moved from recently. Out of 16 baptisms, 13 of the people were from the Baptist church. And 11 of them insisted that they had been baptized for the remission of their sins. And I pursued the matter and, and kept trying to study with them. And in the course of quite a while, they, uh, in their own time, uh, obeyed the gospel, were baptized for the remission of their sins. But I was told that that was an error for pursuing the matter because they they just insisted that they'd been baptized for the mission of their sins and I never heard that before. Right. Many times in <laughs> talking with folk like that, especially in a small town, uh, I just go with them to the denominational preacher and ask him if he or any one of his brethren would so do and they all just uh, not only will say no but they'll begin to talk about us and deride what we stand for. But when you teach someone the plan of salvation and they're good-hearted people, they wouldn't be studying with you if they weren't more interested in the Bible than most people are. And you teach the truth and they read it out of their own Bibles, they'd like to believe that's what they did. And a lot of them can convince themselves that is what they did. But as you continue teaching the Word of God and making application, so you can read in some denominational books, and in, I, I've read in Jehovah's Witnesses books and Adventist books, for instance. I'm corresponding with an old lady who's a leader in the Adventist out in California. She read something I wrote in the Gospel Minutes, and she's been writing me for about six months. She sent me some of the best Adventist literature I ever saw, so much priceless. So I'm going to keep writing to her. But uh, I've read in some of their books that uh, they believe baptism is remission of sins, but you can read three pages later, and they, they don't even know what they mean by that statement. They don't mean you are lost if you aren't baptized. And so as we continue to teach and make application, people begin to see that I wanted to believe I'd done that, but I know I hadn't. And, of course, Billy Graham is uh, their favorite exponent in most of the Baptist churches, and his theme song is still Only Believe. It looks like they'd catch on after a while that, that uh, he doesn't believe in baptism for remission of sins. And I believe that we have answered uh, all of these. Is there any other comment uh, we need to go on if we can. Uh, some have said we need to cover more questions. Thank you. I want to uh, agree with uh, the general position that has been expressed by Brother Ramsey. And what I'm saying is not meant to be disagreeing with that. Uh, we have to be extremely cautious when we're dealing with people in uh, other lands they may be genuine and they may not be now in the case of Prince Sean Carluki mm -hmm. I think that in the, originally it was genuine That's right. I have visited in his home and held gospel meetings where he preached but as time went on Prince Sean Carluki tried to get the building that our people paid for from this side into his own personal name. And it would have happened, except that I had kept all my correspondence with him. And when Brother Perry wrote and asked if I had anything that would indicate that uh, he recognized or had recognized that, uh, that we owned the building and not him, well, it just happened that I had quite a bit of this. So I sent the entire correspondence, and Prince on Karluki was prevented from taking over uh, our, the property that we had paid for, so that the original uh, stand you're saying that he was baptized, that they were baptized for the right purpose, and therefore our brethren, I think that was correct. But, you, but we tend to, to go overboard. Mm -hmm. One more thing, and I'll turn loose. Uh, we had a situation in uh, Vietnam where a man claimed to have been baptized for remission of sins. Well, his daddy was an Alliance preacher, and that's the only preaching he had ever heard. And the Alliance people do not baptize for that reason. So uh, 
one of our missionaries uh, turned over the world radio effort to that man and his wife. His wife had also only had an alliance baptism, which was not for remission of sins, but which they both contended it was. These two, in turn, hired two Buddhists. I mean, unconverted, unregenerated, unanything Buddhists to, be, to supply the other two parts so they could have a quartet. <laughs> and the, the radio program that was being done in those days by World Radio in uh, Vietnam was being done by two alliance people and two Buddhists in the name of the Church of Christ. Mm. So let us be a little bit uh, cautious about some things, and above all things, brethren, let's just don't be naive. That's right. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Let's go on now to another question. <coughs> this is a, an interesting one, uh, too. It has a lot of ramifications over several things that have been said here this week. Does the Bible indicate that the only means of showing one's opposition to a doctrine or person is verbal abuse or ridicule of that doctrine or person? list some biblical examples. I don't believe uh, that anyone believes that ridicule and uh, unkindness is good in dealing with anybody on anything. On the other hand, there are some people who call it ridicule and abuse when the truth is told about evil men. And we're to love everybody. It isn't wrong, though, to tell the truth about evil men because the truth makes us free and evil men don't teach truth and that condemns. So we're obligated to, in standing up for truth, to obey Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. There are many Bible examples of exposing error. <laughs> in Romans 16, we read, uh, verse 17, mark them that cause offenses and uh, doctrines contrary to that which you have received were to mark or point out those who teach error not according to what we believe or have voted on but what has been revealed to us in the scriptures. It's not only not wrong to expose error and tell the truth about evil men it'd be wrong not to. Now some examples. Take First and Second Timothy and Titus. Demas hath forsaken me. That's been in the Bible for all these years. For 19 centuries, Demas has been marked. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Hymenaeus and Philetus made shipwreck of the faith. Alexander the coppersmith. Jude verse 11, been in the scriptures all this time. Woe unto them. They've gone in the way of Cain. They've run greedily after the heir of Balaam. And it perished in the gain, saying of Korah. That's just the truth about evil men who cause harm. Diotrephes, 3 John, called by name as one who would oppose even the apostles of Christ and keep the teaching of the Lord out of the congregation where he was. The most unkind thing we could ever do is let error have a heyday. But let me tell you something. We've grown up... Uh, a generation of folk who've been entertained and coddled and pettered and pampered and taught psychology and humanism and human philosophy. And when they hear the plain gospel preached, they gag on it. Truth must be preached. Error must be exposed. And both are in the spirit of Christ and the apostles and the prophets. We must rebuke error. But we're not to ridicule and abuse even those who are in error. But you just say, Demas have forsaken me today, and boy, you're in bad shape. We live in an age when if I even suggest the Pope of Rome might be a little bit wrong, some people break out in a rash and have a wall-eyed fit. <laughs> uh, it's sort of significant to me, though, that when we were bolder in our preaching and in exposing of error, we were baptizing a whole lot more people than we are today. Again, though, there, and listen carefully, there's even a way to do that. I've heard men expose denominationalism by reading word for word and not with a caustic voice what the Baptist manual by Pendleton or Hiscock said, and they just read it matter-of-factly. They read from Luther what he taught. They read from Calvin what he taught in context and let him have his say. They identify what they're talking about without any abuse, just 
straightforward historical reference. Then I've heard other men get up there and impugn the motives of every denominational preacher, skin people and enjoy it, you know. So don't anyone misunderstand. We're to speak the truth in love. We're to expose error firmly, but with a tear in our eye and a lump in our throat. We're to be concerned with the souls that are lost back of all that. So to we've already given enough Bible example. Uh, the re religious elite of Jesus' day would be the Sadducees. Did you hear what he said to them in Mark 12, 24? You do greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, neither the power of God. To the Pharisees, the blessed Son of God said, You generation of vipers, your house is left unto you desolate. How shall you escape the damnation of hell? That's bold, straightforward denunciation. Did Jesus do wrong? And so I think we've given a lot of Bible on that. Again, we're not defending a censorious, ugly spirit. But the kindest thing you can do to a man in error or people in error is to expose that error so they can see the truth, so they can be saved and go to heaven. You can't be any kinder than that. And brethren who just want kind of a little old social gospel, watered down, wouldn't convert anybody, wouldn't save a peanut or an ant. That's not gospel preaching. They so spake boldly that a great multitude believed. Acts 14. Now we have time for a little comment here, and I'm sure that'll... Johnny, it's important for us to remember as um, gospel preachers and as Christians striving with this particular issue that it's never right to malign personalities, as you've rightly said, uh, just for the sake of maligning the person. But it's extraordinarily difficult to deal with a doctrine that an individual holds without mentioning ever one time the individual's name. Uh, the biblical examples you gave are clear and to the point that names were mentioned. And yet with perfect love in their hearts, the apostles or Jesus himself spoke to refute the false doctrine, replacing it with the truth. Now there's a procedure also that was entailed in the question was asked in logic called reductio ad absurdum. I remember that. Reducing. <laughs> good. <laughs> or reducing an opponent's argument to an absurdity. Now Jesus did that in Matthew 12. They were accusing the Son of God of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus informed them that such an absurdity would not even strike the mind of an intelligent person. If Satan casts out Satan's cohorts, how much more absurd could you be? And reduce their argument to an absurdity. Uh, it wasn't uh, done to point... Uh, uh, a finger at them so as to make them the laughing stock of the community. It wasn't done for the purpose of belittling them. It was done for the purpose of trying to show them what their own doctrine implied, an absurdity. And we're not wrong when we reduce an opponent's position to an absurdity by showing what that particular position implies. For every doctrine that implies a false doctrine is itself false. And if there's any doctrine implied by this particular position... Uh, it is a, a false position. Good. That's simple modus talons argumentation. You know Good. that one too. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, it's like that fellow that was uh, in the oil business out in West Texas, and he heard they were going to transfer him to Mexico, and he got busy trying to learn a little Spanish, so at least he'd know how to order his meal when he got to the cafe in Mexico. And But they shipped him out about a week too early, and when he got there, that restaurant in Mexico, he said, give me some torpedoes and tarpaulins because I'm stiwaino. So... <laughs> But that is a good point there. And, and as you study how Jesus taught and how he rebuked, uh, you come to realize that uh, there are some extreme points in the Bible to get the point across to wake people up. Some people are so far entrenched in error that if you don't use that type of reasoning, they'll never catch on. They'll never get the point. There are probably a lot of people in this room right now, percentage-wise, that are New Testament Christians because someone made you see how absurd denominational doctrine was. And you go back and hug those people's neck, don't you? You're not mad at them. They did you a favor. All right? Uh, John, I think this would be a good time to, uh, the students here, we're talking about Baptists, you know, and what they believe. Uh, you just don't find Baptists anymore. 
as you read about in Hickox or Pendleton's manual, or you could take any kind, Westminster, Confession of Faith, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. So about the only Baptist you find anymore is the primitive Baptist, and most of them are up above the Mason-Dixon line that really stick to the word tulip that we use quite often. Now, you could explain tulip till you got black in the face. And a Baptist person said, I don't believe that. And the preacher don't preach that. So what we've got now is what the Baptist used to refer to as interdenominational people. Anything goes. Any, all churches are all right and, and good, so they say. Now, years ago, you couldn't hear a Baptist say that. They said, so we got a bunch of Moodyites and a bunch of Wheatonites and a bunch of Grahamites to deal with, not Baptists. All right. Anybody else now on this point before we go into another question? Uh, Byron Denman over here. Let's get someone that hasn't made a comment on previous questions, if we could. Okay. Uh, to further illustrate what has been discussed, we often hear that when genuine love, godly love, the kind of love that Christ had for the people that he tried to teach and even lead out of, of era is manifest that the things that we've been discussing just don't happen. In other words, you don't tell somebody they're wrong if you love them. And to me, one of the classic illustrations, and so often when I hear even some of our brothers preach on this subject of love and compassion and kindness one toward another, I think this illustration uh, is usually absent from uh, their lessons when they have drawn an incorrect conclusion. Mark 10, 21 is what I'm trying to say. We know we have more than one example of the discourse that took place between Jesus and the rich young ruler. Mark's account, if I've studied it accurately, is the only one that has the phrase that says, Jesus beholding him loved him. And then he told him what he needed to hear, not what he wanted to hear. That's right. And that's the kind of love we've got to have in our preaching and teaching today. That's right. That's a good reference. In Revelation 3.19... Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. A very interesting point that was suggested a moment ago uh, that made me think of this. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said concerning the immoral man in Corinth, withdraw from that ungodly fellow. But read 2 Corinthians chapters 2 and 7, and the man had repented. And he said, now receive him back, lest he be swallowed up with his overmuch grief. Godly sorrow, work of repentance, and to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world, work of death. The very one who said in the spirit of Christ and in the name of Christ, withdraw from that ungodly fellow. Now in tender love, the same love that manifested the first statement, says now receive him back. He's repented. We must have heart in our preaching. We must love the Lord and love the souls of men and show that we do. But if we really love the truth, we can't see it uh, tampered with abused, shoved underneath men's feet and stomped on. I hear people talk about love for our fellow man. How about love for God? How about love for truth? Somebody's got to stand up for God and his word. And if we really love, as our brother prayed last night, because God first loved us, we will not allow men to abuse the truth for their own sake as well as the truth's sake. I've had a lot of people come to me through the years and say, when I first heard you preach, I couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand what you said and couldn't stand you. They said, as we continue to study our Bible, we thank God for what you said. And we're brethren because of that. Well, I could turn to them and say we're brethren also because way down deep, you had a good and honest heart too. Preach the truth in love. All right, let's go to another one here. <coughs> Should an unfaithful Christian man be asked to take part in the worship services, such as leading prayer, singing, or waiting on the table? No. Uh, next question. <laughs> I do want to say one thing on that. We're going to get through a lot of these questions today. It won't take us long. <laughs> but this old song of give him a class and he'll be faithful, that's as backwards as anything I ever heard in my life. Amen. Who's going to teach a Bible class? Someone that's faithful and loves the Lord and stands the truth. The very idea, let old hypocrite Jones help with the Lord's Supper and he may come back next month. And I've been in places where it was ridiculous. Sorriest men in town, everybody in town knew it, up there in front of the table, probably members of the Masonic Lodge and out drinking and 
Here they were up there helping with the worship, so-called. How could you really think there was much sincere devotion in that? I was in a place one time where a fellow that had caused trouble for 20 years was leading the singing, and it's sort of like a circus with him. He, he was just entertaining, see. And he had caused more harm in the church, and they, they were afraid of him. So they let him up there to lead the whole congregation. How could spiritually minded people really appreciate that? And you know what we do for folk like that? We salve their conscience and harden their heart by doing that. Very idea. And again, I've got to get on my soapbox. If I were in charge of Bible classes, let me tell you how we'd do it. We'd find out how many knowledgeable, spiritual, Christ-centered teachers we had, and that's how many classes we'd have. Amen. We've got things backwards. We build our buildings and have 400 classrooms. We've got to have 400 teachers. If they don't know the books of the Bible or anything else, and they live like the devil, we just shove them in there and lock the door when they volunteer, you know. We had 10 spiritual, knowledgeable teachers in a congregation of 500. That's how many classes we ought to have. I'd rather all four of my kids be with one teacher, even though their ages are scattered out, that knows the book and knows the Lord, than put in the right place because the Baptist Sunday School Board said that's the way to do it. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> you are now a writer for the Christian Bible Teacher Magazine. <laughs> all right. Now, here, oh, here's some good questions. This will get us started. Why is it that we seem to send our young preachers to work with small churches or to work in difficult fields while the older, more mature, experienced men seem to enjoy locating with the big, more affluent churches where his salary is higher, home larger, and fancier? Well, I got the wrong question. I'm sorry. Uh, why are... Why are these not out going from town to town preaching the gospel of the lost and struggling with the cities of uh, few or no Christians as Paul did? Where are our priorities? Place the young men in the pulpits where there are elders and seasoned mem men uh, and show your, uh, where there are elders and you seasoned men show your faith and get out into the world where the lost needs you. The church needs not pulpit preachers as much as preaching, teaching elders to send out more evangelists. Why so many preacher training schools when Jesus said, make disciples, not pulpit preachers? Will someone during this lectureship give practical information about discipling? Evangelism goes far beyond hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Now, one thing we could do is push that off in the corner and make fun of whoever asked it and uh, make a few little dodges here and there and go home, but that wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be honest. There's enough truth right there to awaken us and challenge us for a long, long time. If I were to make any exception of that at all, it would be this, and I don't believe that it's rationalizing because I've spent a lot of my time preaching in the new fields, meeting in rented halls, and so forth. In fact, I'm the best janitor you ever saw because I met in so many rented halls. I have to get up early on Sunday morning and sweep out the beer cans and the poker chips and the cigarette butts and the cards and set the pulpit stand in between pool tables and put the chairs out. I, I've been there. And the sad thing is a lot of my brethren have never been anywhere but in the big churches in Texas and Tennessee and points between, and they don't know what they've missed. But I should have done a lot more than I did. I just did some, and so I can identify with both places. The only exception I would make to this at all is the following. I am convinced, and I guess I've traveled among brethren the last five years as much as any preacher among us, I'm convinced that one of the greatest needs we have in the church of our Lord is to strengthen the church in Texas and Tennessee. Amen. We are in the midst of apostasy, indifference, materialism, and a lot of this work of spreading the gospel in fields beyond is not going to get done if we don't have some people that love the church and love the souls of men and know the book and aren't afraid to preach it. But having said all that, there is a great miscarriage of balance in regard to these matters of spreading the gospel. A very, very, very minute percentage of all gospel preachers are in difficult fields. The vast, vast majority are right here where the easy living is. We need to impress upon our minds the points that were read in that question. All right? Let me add to that, amen, Johnny. I often said, coming from 
Michigan down here that I don't have much sympathy for the brethren if we can't get the job done down here when uh, there are pulpits screaming for sound preaching in uh, Michigan, Canada, other places. Uh, but having said that, let me try to caution all of us just a bit. I had a brother who critiqued an article that I'd written, published in The Restore.